So good afternoon, everyone. Before we start the presentation, um, let me thank our co-authors, Mr. Robert Palomar, Mr. Mark Ruiz, and of course, Dr. Justine Sikat for their valuable um, contribution to this study. We would also like to acknowledge the support and guidance of Dr. Marife Ballesteros and Dr. Aniseto Beta Jr. and the help of Ms. Lucy Melendez, Jocelyn Almeda, and Christine Salazar in the process of the project. Lastly, this study would not be uh, possible without the help of the DILG SLG PPMO, headed by Mr. Richard Villajorte and his team, Mr. Glenn Miranda and Ms. Regina Pilandas. Thank you very much. So today, uh, we will be presenting the study on the state devolution in the pre-Mandanas Philippines. So I will start the presentation and we'll pass it to Ms. Marian Hukov for the results and recommendations. Next slide, please. So the flow of the presentation will start with the background of the study and objectives, followed by the methodology and then the assessment of the three subsections, starting with the state and trends of devolved functions, then the phasing of devolved programs, projects and activities or the PPAs, and lastly, the assessment on the capacity development interventions needed. After the results, the key takeaways and recommendations will be presented. Next slide, please. The Philippine government was um, highly centralized for more than four centuries. It has a long tradition for political administrative centralism before being challenged by the 1987 constitution and the local government code. Philippine decentralization efforts may be traced back to the first Philippine Republic from 1898 to 1902 with the provision of local economy to provinces. This was followed by the American regime from 1902 to 1935, where the local government was placed um, under military control and moved towards centralization. So from 1946 to 1986, there have been five attempts to empower the four levels of local government in terms of political and administrative authority just before the 1987 constitution. However, during the martial law in 1972 to 1986, efforts toward decentralization were constrained. Following the martial law period, the 1987 constitution was introduced uh, with a general provision indicating that Congress shall enact a local government code, which eventually led to the 1991 local government code. In the current years, decentralization efforts has significantly jumped forward as the Mandanas Garcia Supreme Court ruling or the Mandanas ruling attained its finality in 2019. So this decision effectively increases the tax base for intergovernmental fiscal transfers or the national tax allotment. Since the finality of um, the Mandanas ruling, national government oversight agencies and fiscal policymakers have been contemplating how to best ensure a well-planned and smooth um, implementation. So with this, the executive order number 138 in the 2021 was issued to provide guidelines for the effective transition of functions and responsibilities to LGUs. The EO also includes the design and review of the devolution transition plans or the DTPs. Next slide, please. So given the state of devolution in the country, some uncertainty arises on how LGUs will manage the devolved functions and whether the prescribed devolution transition period is sufficient. Hence, the main objective of this study is to establish the current state of decentralized LGU functions, services, and capacities, specifically to examine the proposed phase assumption of devolved functions, to identify gaps of assistance needed to assume the devolved functions, to identify how decentralization can be deepened for LGUs, and to identify how the delivery of devolved services can be improved towards the attainment of national goals. So with this, the results of this review and assessment could guide policymakers and could be the basis of the following, further examination of the LGU needs, trigger the revisiting of the LGC and provisions of the EO138, and prompt rethinking of the rational planning or the CDP process. The results of this um, study could also be used as a baseline for monitoring and evaluating progress in devolution. Next slide, please. So for the methodology, the study used the submitted LGU devolution transition plans or the DTPs from 76 provinces 
142 cities and 300 municipalities and concentrated on the social welfare, health, agriculture, environment, disaster risk reduction management, and infrastructure sector. Moreover, the data used for this study were generated from only the three annexes of DTPs. That is the data from Annex E, F, and G. The Annex E is for the state of devolved functions, services, and facilities. The Annex F is for the phasing of full assumptions of devolved functions, services, and facilities. And the Annex G is the Capacity Development Agenda, or the CAPDEL. Next slide, please. So the study was able to review the 76 provincial DTPs, 142 city DTPs, and sample of 300 municipality DDPs out of 1,373 municipalities, excluding LGUs from the BARM. So the sampled municipalities were stratified according to LGU income classification so that each income class is represented. So the sampling breakdown is as follows. Next slide, please. Okay, so from the collected DDPs, the study observes some limitations. So for the data limitations, there's lack of standardization or, nor, or no clear classification of identified devolved functions into PPAs. For example, the structure of the templates may have left too much room for the interpretation of the LGUs. There were parts of the templates that are left blank or there was an error in the submission of the LGU into the DILG system, such as missing attachments or duplicating files. The study also pointed out that there's lack of complete detailed list of functions and the current status of devolution. We observed that there are terminologies used in the templates that are similarly defined across LGUs. However, there are also some terminologies used in the templates that are not consistent across LGUs. There's also no measurement of the quality of the current devolved services. And there's also the absence of the national government agency DTPs as a benchmark and ambiguous data or no data entries for the year of full assumption, funding, resources, requirements, and etc. So with these limitations or challenges, the study points out some recommendations for the DTP templates and the, and the data collection, such as that there should be direct guidelines relating to the filling out of the templates to ensure consistent and complete information. There's a need for the LGU DTPs to align with the national government agencies DTPs. And the study also recommends to explore for alternative solutions to improve the consolidation of collected DTPs. Next slide, please. So from the reviewed DTPs, this is the summary of observed LGU PPAs per sector. As you can see, the majority of the listed PPAs of the LGUs are in health sector. Most of the PPAs listed by the provinces are under the health sector and agriculture sector, while most of the listed PPAs of the cities and municipalities are under the social welfare sector and health sector. Next slide, please. So for this section, um, let me now pass the floor to Ms. Marian to present the study's results, key takeaways, and recommendations. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Rixie, and good afternoon, everyone. I will now be presenting the findings from our assessment of the DTP data, starting with the state and trends of devolved functions. Uh, so here are the main findings from the analysis. First, the study team finds that the rationale behind how LGUs identify their devolved functions is unclear. Second, there is an evident variation across provincial sectoral priorities, and third, there is an, also an evident variation between city and municipal sectoral priorities. So here what you can see are heat maps or the average number of devolved PPAs identified by the LGUs in their DTPs that they submitted to the ILG. So the darker color pertains to regions with more devolved functions per LGU, and lighter colored areas refer to less number of existing devolved functions. Next slide, please. Here is a summary table on the number of devolved PPAs segmented by LGU capacity and performance. 
we find that around half of the LGUs in the study belong to quadrant one or high capacity, high performance. And these account for around half of all PPAs being devolved. Meanwhile, around one-fourth or 25% of the LGUs in our data are classified as low-capacity, low-performance. That would be quadrant three. And the remaining one-fourth is split between quadrant two, low-capacity, high-performance, and quadrant four, high-capacity, low-performance. Next slide, please. Our first main observation is the unclear rationale behind how LGUs identify devolved functions. So the study team tested various hypotheses, such as devolved functions being driven by the ERA or the NDA. Uh, we asked, do high ERA recipient LGUs also identify more devolved functions? And what we found is that there's a weak correlation between the number of devolved functions and the ERA. Next. For the health sector in particular, the team tested the hypothesis of whether devolved PPAs are driven by population density, and we found weak correlation at the province level. And we also found a consider considerable variation in PPAs assumed by the provinces with darker areas having assumed more devolved functions. Next. For health sector at the city level, there is also weak correlation between assumed devolved functions and population density and high variation across cities. And next. And we make the same observation for the health sector at the municipal level. Next slide. For social welfare, the team compared areas in the country with high poverty incidence depicted by dark red areas in the heat map to your right uh, to the number of devolved PPAs. So we expect that high poverty areas would also have corresponding high number of devolved PPAs for social welfare. And while we see this in some areas as highlighted by the arrows, uh, it is not the case for the other high poverty areas, especially in Eastern and Central Visayas and in Mindanao. Next, please. For agriculture, we compared areas with high agriculture gross value added. These are the dark red agricultural regions to the right uh, with the number of the devolved PPAs. And we observe high variation across provinces, cities, and municipalities. Uh, we explore more of these variations in the succeeding slides. Um, but before moving on, we would like to note that without uh, the NGA DTPs, with the exception of DOH, as uh, when we were writing this uh, report, it was difficult to benchmark and determine the reason behind the differences that we observe across different LGUs. Okay, next. Moving on, uh, the second main finding is that the provinces have distinct sectoral and functional priorities represented by the devolved PPAs that they have identified. So for agriculture, there are four main functions assigned to the provinces, and we find that different provinces prioritize different functions. For example, credit and marketing services uh, have been prioritized in Central Luzon and Davao. That's the upper left. Uh, graph, uh, heat map, and dairy farms and insemination centers are more pronounced in, uh, uh, sorry, next slide. There. Um, for credit and marketing services, this is the upper left heat, heat map. And then for dairy farms and insemination centers, they are more pronounced in South Luzon. This is the lower left heat map. So for the succeeding slides, we will not go into the details of which, which functions are prioritized where, but what we want to highlight is that there is a variation across what provinces uh, prioritize as illustrated by the heat maps. Next slide. So for environment, we observe inter-province variation, but this is expected since not all provinces have the same geography. So for instance, highly urbanized provinces would have uh, less devolved natural resource management functions compared to uh, less urbanized provinces. Next. Uh, we make the same observation for social welfare. For example, provinces in Luzon have devolved more PPAs for relief operations. That's the upper right graph. Uh, 
while the lower left uh, graph, we see Central Luzon and Jensen having more devolved PPAs for rebel returnees. Next. For infrastructure support, um, uh, provinces from different regions also signal differing priorities represented by the dark blue areas. And next. And finally, we make the same observation for the RRM sector. Okay. Moving on, the third main finding is the variation in functional priorities across cities and municipalities. So on this slide, we present the heat maps for the different health sector functions. We will not discuss the details, but we want to highlight again the varying trends per function. Uh, and for a detailed discussion of the variation, you may request for a copy of our paper and uh, it is uh, discussed in detail in the paper. Okay. So what we will show you from here on are the heat maps for the different um, functions per sector. So this is a continuation of the health sector functions. Next, uh, these are the functional priorities for agriculture. And we see, again, a variation uh, across cities and municipalities. So this is for agri. Next, uh, for social welfare uh, priorities. Next. For environment, uh, there is still considerable variation. Uh, for DRRM, there is also considerable variation in the devolved functions. Next. And finally, uh, infrastructure. Uh, hence, we conclude that there are different priorities as represented by the PPAs being devolved across cities, across municipalities, and even uh, if we compare between cities and municipalities from the same provinces, they, uh, they have different uh, priorities as indicated by the PPAs. Um, we find that these findings can be useful to inform NGA DTPs or for an assessment of what should be versus what is. Um, currently being devolved. Okay, moving on. Uh, next, we present the findings on the facing of the devolved PPAs. Uh, the data used for this section is based on the self-assessment of LGUs on their forecast completion date for each function. So the study considers the latest year provided in the DTP as the year of completion. We present completion rates per function, which is the share of LGUs that project full devolution in a given year. Uh, hence, the completion rate for each function is interpreted as the percentage of LGUs with full devolution for a given year. Next, we have three main findings. First is that based on LGU forecasts, none of the functions devolved are expected to be fully devolved by end 2024, which is the target in EO138. Second, we observe a noticeable jump in com completion rates from 2023 to 2024, and we will illustrate this in the succeeding slides. And third, there are missing data or LGUs were not able to provide the year of completion for a significant number of devolved functions. And this is especially true for the RRM functions. Next. So for the devolved functions to provinces, we find that at most 80 to 90% completion for health, uh, that's the leftmost, set of graphs, and some agricultural functions by 2024. There is a visible jump from 2023, which is the orange bar, to 2024, the gray bar. Uh, for example, uh, for health services, which is the leftmost bars, in 2023, uh, only 20% of the LGUs indicated uh, expect full devolution of health sector functions. Uh, that's the orange bar. But this jumps to 80%, the gray bar, uh, in the following year. So for some functions also, we note that um, some LGUs were not able to provide the completion date 
for uh, for some functions in their DTPs, as indicated by the known data uh, indicator. Next, uh, we establish the same trends for cities, um, but in addition, we note of the higher projected completion rates for social welfare functions relative to other sec uh, other sectors such as agriculture. Next. Here are the completion rates for health, environment, and DRRM uh, devolved functions to cities. We take note of the missing data for DRRM. So some LGUs did not indicate their forecast for full devolution for these functions. And the same trends are seen in the infrastructure sector. Next. Finally, we establish the same observations for the devolved functions to the municipalities. And again, we find a relatively higher completion rates for social welfare functions relative to the other sectors. Next. For uh, health sector functions, the jump can be seen from 2023 to 24. And then there's another jump uh, of completion from uh, 2024 onwards uh, for the health sector devolved functions. Next. Again, we take note of the missing data for environment and DRRM functions. So this is uh, the data from municipal LGU DTPs. Next. Uh, finally, here are the completion rates for infrastructure functions devolved to um, municipalities and the same trends apply. Okay. Uh, finally, in this section, we present the capacity development interventions needed by LGUs to support their devo uh, devolution efforts. So we adopt DILG's capacity development framework, which defines six pillars that are essential to effective service delivery. These are structure, competencies, management systems, enabling policies, knowledge, man knowledge management, and leadership. And in the DTPs, the LGUs were free to identify their needed inputs or interventions for each pillar. So uh, these are classified by the study team into six categories, namely uh, hiring of personnel, guidelines, uh, monitoring and evaluation, procurement of equipment, uh, trainings, and technical assistance and others. So we make five cross-cutting observations. First is that uh, the heavily identified need of LGUs is the hiring of personnel or increase in plantilla. Second, um, this increase in personnel is to be supported by trainings and technical assistance. Third, LGUs also identify the need for monitoring and evaluation tools. Fourth, uh, fewer LGUs identified the need for acquisition and procurement of equipment or construction of facilities as a needed intervention for devolution. And fifth, uh, LGUs provided a limited listing of cap dev needs for DRRM and infrastructure functions. Next slide. So here uh, are spider diagrams for the cap dev needs for social welfare services for provinces, cities, and municipalities. So the diagram plots the number of LGUs that have identified an intervention needed for each of the six pillars. So for example, for the structure pillar, if we look at the graph for the provinces, uh, 70 provinces have indicated a need to hire personnel. So that's the light blue line. The provinces also indicated that trainings, which is the purple line, uh, are needed for competencies, but also for leadership and knowledge learning pillars. Now, guidelines and consultations represented by the orange line are needed interventions for enabling policies pillar, leadership, and competencies as well. So we find the same needs across provinces, cities, and municipalities. For uh, the health sector, the same needs are applicable for provinces, cities, and municipalities. Uh, next. 
Uh, here are the CAP dev needs for agriculture. And again, it's uh, basically the same trend of what is required for each pillar. Next. Again, for the environment sector, it's the same uh, needs, capacity development needs. Uh, next. Now for DRRM, we want to highlight that there is a majority of the LGUs that have not identified any cap dev needs for them to perform the devolved functions for DRRM. So this is represented by the dark blue line. Um, none means um, if there was no uh, data provided in the TTP as to the RRM interventions needed by the LGU. So a significant number of LGUs did not identify any cap dev needs for the RRM for provinces, cities, and municipalities. Next. And uh, there is this, the same trend is also seen for the infrastructure sector, but it's more pronounced only in the cities and municipalities. So for cities and municipalities, no interventions were identified for the six pillars for the infrastructure uh, sector devolution. Next. Uh, uh, okay, so to conclude, we present the, we highlight the study's main takeaways. Uh, first, uh, the unclear rationale on how LGUs prioritize devolved functions stress the need for greater guidance from NGAs. Second, the consistent, consistent pattern under, of under-identification of DRRM functions and missing data indicates a need for greater guidance on DRRM. Next. Third, based on LGU projections, none of the devolved functions are expected to be fully devolved by end 2024. Fourth, most needed CAP dev interventions are personnel, training, guidance and consultations, and monitoring and evaluation tools. And next. Fifth, uh, supplementary data collection can provide both qualitative and quantitative support to our analysis and findings. Next, finally, uh, key recommendations of the study are as follows. First, a greater role of coordination from national to local can help improve planning and implementation of the LGU DTPs and devolution in general. Second, the heat maps presented earlier illustrate varying needs and priorities of LGUs, and so decentralization may not be a one-size-fits-all and an asymmetric approach may be beneficial. And third, uh, a mechanism for collection of data can help government evaluate the progress and effectiveness of its decentralization efforts in the future. So that ends our presentation. Uh, thank you very much for your attention.